welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. How's it going, Lance? It's going fantastic, Tim. If I was any better, they'd have to throw a straight jacket on me. <laughs> well, great point, and uh, I'm glad to hear that you're doing well. And uh, Lance, this episode we recorded last Thursday night as a part of our live True Crime Thursday nights on Get Vocal. And we were joined by Mr. Carl DeNaro and Mr. Mike Morford. You all know who Mike Morford is. If you're listening to this show, you, you definitely know who Mike Morford is. But Carl DeNaro, you may not know. You may not recognize that name. He is the author of a book called The Son of Sam and Me, and that's co-written with uh, Brian Whitney. Carl DeNaro was shot by The Son of Sam in 1976 in New York City, and he survived a bullet shot to the head. Yeah, and our good friend Mike Morford reached out to us because Carl was on uh, Mike's show, Criminology, and he said, you should have Carl on one of these live Get Vocal Nights that you do every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, Lance. And uh, and he was right because he thought this would be a great conversation to sort of discuss the son of Sam, yes, but also the, I guess you could say, conspiracy theory that... Mr. Carl DeNaro was not shot by the son of Sam himself, but it was actually some of these murders and, and possibly Carl's shooting was attributed incorrectly to the son of Sam, David Berkowitz, and really should be attributed to uh, sort of a mystery that hasn't really been fully unfurled yet. And if anyone's looking for more information on this, check out the fantastic documentary on Netflix called Sons of Sam. Carl is featured in it uh, quite a bit. He talks about his experience. He talks about his belief that he likely was not shot by David Berkowitz and also his relationship with Maury Terry, who wrote the book, The Ultimate Evil, which goes through the possibilities that this was part of a satanic cult, a religious cult, uh, really climbs the ladder of influential people who might be involved with this, both uh, in law enforcement and also in the cult world, like Charlie Manson. Right. And Carl was a buddy of Maury Terry um, before he passed away. And obviously, again, check out the documentary on Netflix called Sons of Sam, which really goes into Maury and this whole theory. And uh, so much so that Carl's book, the Son of Sam and Me. The subtitle is The Truth About Why I Wasn't Shot by David Berkowitz. So he really uh, 100% believes this. So give this interview a listen. And if you don't walk away a believer of Carl's theory that he was not shot by David Berkowitz, you will at least walk away with a good feeling about Carl. He really does remind you of like your, your uncle that you see at Thanksgiving and you crack a few beers with and have some good laughs with. Yeah, I, Carl is not exactly uh, the QAnon shaman here, uh, Lance. He's, uh, you know, th there's a lot of real good reasons why he um, believes what he does. And uh, again, give him a listen because you're definitely going to think that this is interesting regardless which side of the fence you fall. And before we throw it to the interview, Tim, we are going to be traveling soon. We are going to be in a old stomping ground of ours at one point. We were sort of stalking around the streets of Saratoga Springs, looking into the Sheila Shepard murder. Well, we will be back in Saratoga Springs on Thursday, June 17th. That's right around the corner. What are we doing there, Tim? Tell me why you're taking me to Saratoga Springs again. Well, it's a lovely town, and uh, we are taking part in an event called Saratoga True Crime Night, and it's put on by Saratoga Living, some friends of ours, and our friends at the Saratoga True Crime Club. It's going to be a great event. Josh Hallmark from True Crime Bullshit is going to be there. We're going to be there, Lance, and some other great guests. For example, they will have DNA specialist Toby Kirschman, who worked on the Golden State Killer case. And Dr. Christina Lane and Dr. Christopher Kunkel from the Cold Case Analysis Center at the College of St. Rose, which is right there in Albany. And also our friend Marcella Hammer from the Saratoga True Crime Club. The event starts at 6 p.m. It goes to 9 p.m. There will be drinks. There will be dinner and snacks. And there will be a VIP section. There will be a lot going on. And you can get your tickets on Eventbrite. Go to eventbrite.com and search Saratoga True Crime Night. Or you could just click the link in the show notes. And we will see you there. 
And uh, thank you very much for listening to this episode. Make sure to check out Sons of Sam and check out Mike Morford's show and check out Carl's book while you're at it. Toggle yourself on over to Amazon and pick up a copy of Carl's book. Link in the show notes. Welcome, Mike and Carl. What is going on? How's it going tonight? Hey, Tim. Hey, Lance. Hey, Mike. What's going on, Thank Carl? you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. This is kind of a, a bit of a surreal moment. I feel like it's a bit of a surreal moment for me because I watched the documentary, and I think I it's so, it's so bizarre to me that we're in the true crime business, the true crime genre, and I know about The Son of Sam, I didn't know that much about the son of Sam and I, and I watched the documentary and I saw you on the documentary and I, and I thought to myself how amazing it was that you were a survivor of an attack. And I never thought until Mike brought it to us that we could actually speak to you that this was even like possible. So it's a bit surreal to me. I'm a, I'm a bit, modestly intimidated right now well that makes well, both of us <laughs> <laughs> i mean you're you you're you are you are one of the one of the survivors you're one of the heroes and you inspire other survivors and that that makes you at least a if not a hero it makes you have amazing humanity so that there's that yeah thank you i have no idea why you're talking to someone like, like mike morford though <laughs> yeah, carl was kind enough to come on criminology and um, his story was just, I just got blown away by his story. And I was like, wow. And I had known about Maury's book and research, but the more I talked to Carl and the more I found out how much he was involved in, in that process of doing research to see if there might've been more to the case than meets the eye. I just, uh, I just thought it was really cool. And then the fact he's willing to take the time to answer questions and respond to, you know, some of the criticism and, and maybe enlighten some people on why there might be more than meets the eye is just a, it's pretty cool to talk with them. Carl, w what was working on the documentary like? Uh, well, let, let's, uh, first of all, I, I interviewed for about five hours. And um, if you watched all four episodes, I'm probably gone for three minutes. So <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not really fun. It, you know, I guess the first time you do it, it's, uh, you know, it's exciting, but, um, I, I, you know, I've done a few shows, I've done a few podcasts, uh, and, you know, I mean, it's something I had to do, but, um, you know, it was basically just telling, telling, telling my story, answering questions that, uh, Josh Seaman, uh, posed to me and that was it. And I know you probably get this all the time when you're when you're speaking about uh, what happened, but for for anybody who is not super familiar with your story, can you go back to to that time and then we can talk about your relationship with Maury and and how you came to write your own book? Can you talk to us about what happened that night? Sure. I mean, there's to to be honest with you, the, it, there's really not much to talk about. I didn't see anything. I was at a at a bar, my neighborhood bar, and um, you know ran into uh, a friend, and uh, we decided to uh, head out. And uh, we got in our car. We drove I don't know seven or eight blocks uh, in in my neighborhood, and pulled up um, in front of a you know in front of a house, and um, it was you know the street light. I think the street light was out. I'm not even sure. It looked like a good spot to make out when you're 20 years old. I guess anything, any spot looks good. Uh, so, you know, we, we were there for, uh, you know, three, four, maybe five minutes, and not long at all. And um, and then uh, my life changed. You know, the uh, I didn't hear gunshots, but uh, there was glass, uh, auto glass all over. I had cuts in my uh, hands um, from the glass, and I told her I knew we were in trouble. Um, I guess at this point, shock, uh, shock had set in. Um, so I, you know, told her, you know, to get out of here, start the car, get out of here. And, uh, and she, you know, started the car, went down the block. And then I passed out for about 10 seconds. And when I came to, she was, 
in a tizzy because she had no idea where she was. Uh, she, she wasn't from my neighborhood. She lived a couple towns over. And uh, I directed her back to the bar and uh, went, you know, got out of the car, walked into the bar. And the guy at the door, um, I've been hanging out at this bar for five years. Uh, I'll save the, the uh, math for you. I guess I was 15 when I was hang started hanging out there. Uh, but it was, you know, I, I'm sure every town has one. It's, a, you know, what I like to call an old man's bar. And at night, you know, younger people went there. And uh, the guy at the door said, Carl, you don't look good. And I said, I don't feel good. I think the car exploded. And um, with that, um, I, I forgot to say I had long hair at the time. I had hair down to my shoulders. And the, my hair was holding um, the blood in from the head wound that I didn't even know I had. And uh, he sat me down and my shirt just turned blood red. And uh, my friends who were in the bar, they said, oh, we got to get him to the hospital. And walked back out and got into a friend's car. And uh, uh, Bob and uh, Marty and Steve uh, drove me to uh, Flushing Hospital emergency room. So the story really starts many years later, you know, as far as um, what, uh, uh, you know, what, you know, my research and, and what, what I uncovered, what Maury uncovered. Um, I, I got all my news uh, after that night. I got all my news from the newspapers uh, like everyone else. So I had no idea other people were involved or there was a cult or none of that. Um, this didn't happen for uh my first uh, indication was uh, four years later when one of the uh, lawyers in a civil case, uh, you know, kept telling the judge, you know, other people are involved. And uh, I asked my lawyer, what, he's, what was he talking about? And he said, other people were involved. And I said, yeah, okay, interesting. But, you know, you have to realize this is 1980, no internet. And uh, so it just kind of just, you know, it, it, nothing came of it. And then seven years later, Maury, uh, Maury printed his, uh, his book, uh, The Ultimate Evil, and uh, that just blew me away. From there, I was like, wow, this, this, this certainly has, uh, has legs. And, uh, you know, I started to be a believer at that point. The story is incredible so far. It's unbelievable that you are here speaking with us right now. Um, the, the, the young woman you were in the car with, she, she survived. She wasn't shot, right? She wasn't shot. It was her car. I was in the passenger seat. And again, I had long hair. So, you know, the, the assumption is I uh, was mistaken for a female. Damn. And you passed out briefly and then woke up? Yeah, maybe like t literally like 10 seconds. Um, we, we, yeah. were about, we were about two blocks from, from where I got shot. So, uh, yeah. And I'm not sure. You, your next question is probably why didn't you go to the hospital? And that's a good question. I don't have an answer. <laughs> I just no. um, I just went back to the bar where I started at, and um, like I said, it. You know, I, looking back, I, I must have been in shock because um, like I said I knew I was hurt, um, but uh, I really didn't know what happened. Right, you didn't know that the, you didn't. Why would you ever think that there was a? Uh, like a bullet wound. Like, why would you ever think that you were shot? You, you said that you told them that you thought you were, um, you thought the car exploded or something. So, yeah, I mean, and that's just based on, you know, the glass, uh, you know, you know, the windows were, uh, basically shot out the back window was shot out and the passenger side window. How many shots were there? I believe there were four. Yeah. I'm not being evasive. I just don't know. And, uh, unfortunately I didn't realize, um, I didn't realize for many years that uh, I needed to uh, start investigating myself. So uh, I really didn't start investigating until 1994. So uh, it took 18 years for me to realize that, you know, something, something's not right. And at that point, there, the police reports were basically nowhere to be found. I'm sure they exist somewhere, but uh, up to now, I, I haven't seen one, one report. Was the forty four caliber killer or the son of Sam like was that was was that in were you aware of that at the time? No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, let me just go back a little bit. Um, I I've, uh, 
where the uh, the shooting attack happened was uh, in in a fairly upscale neighborhood in uh, North Flushing, which even to this day it's it's upscale. Um, you know, Tudor houses, doctors, lawyers, architects. Um, there was no, even though New York City was, uh, you know, in in in, a, in, in turmoil. Um, you know, the murder rate was was sky high. Uh, we we didn't really um, it didn't really affect us. It didn't affect our. We didn't have shootings. We didn't have robberies. Um, you know, domestic disputes, car accidents, public drunkenness. That's, that was pretty much it. So, and and also I was the um, the second victim. So, son of Sam, or originally the forty four caliber killer, didn't come into uh, in, it didn't come to the public's um, public's eye until uh, six months later. It's a good thing that that you only got a fragment of that bullet, so you're able to to be here to tell your story. Without a doubt, <laughs> yeah, I don't think. Um, I don't think too many people can say they got shot in the head to survive. And I think even less people can say they got shot in the head with 44 and survive. So uh, I'm, I'm, believe me, I know I'm a lucky guy. Well, what was it like when you started investigating? I, I can't, I kind of can't even imagine um, taking that twist and, and starting to investigate this yourself. Yeah. So <clears throat> what happened was uh, um, in 1990, I happened to, uh, a woman I work with, uh, she told me her dad was a NYPD ballistics uh, detective, and he had worked on my case. And um, I got the chance to meet him, and he told me that um, what he put in his report was a ninety-pound weakling or a, a woman. Um, and I was, and I really don't know much more than that. I I kind of regret that it I didn't press him for more answers, but. Um, uh, you know, I believe that statement that he told me was made because of the wildness of the um, of the shooter. Uh, otherwise, I'd be dead. And then in '93, Maury Terry did a jailhouse interview with David Berkowitz, and uh, it was, I think, a three part segment. And um, in one of the segments, he flat out asked him, "Did you shoot Carl Denaro?" And Berkowitz said, "No," and he's. And, and uh, he said, do you know who did? And uh, when well, he said, was it a man? Well, you know, was it, he said, no, a woman. So at this point, you, know, you just have to realize that the, these stories that I'm telling you, this is all before I knew Maury Terry. No one really knew this story about the ballistics detective uh, except me and his daughter. Um, so when I, when I saw this interview on TV, you can imagine it blew my mind. So now I'm putting everything together, you know, back in 1980, the lawyer saying other people are involved, reading Maury's book, the ballistics detective saying a, a 90 pound weakling or a woman. And now I got Berkowitz saying a woman shot me. Now I'm totally sold. Um, and about... Yeah, I'm not really sure. Six months and eight months later, um, <clears throat> Geraldo Rivera asked me to be on his show, and I agreed. And um, they just, you know, the producer just asked me to uh, to meet at this bar in, in Manhattan, <clears throat> in Manhattan on 57th Street, where I was going to meet Maury for the first time, and then go to the studio for the interview. Uh, so. Yes, yeah, so that's when I met Maury. We became instant friends. I think the next day I started uh, helping Maury out doing the investigation. And, and I'm still uh, doing it. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. Um, w with your book, too. Your book, I, I imagine, um, has, a has a lot of these same themes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I, I just felt like I needed to, uh, to tell this, my story. It's obviously, I really can't talk about my story when I'm talking about the uh, Son of Sam shootings, um, but it was really more about my quest for the truth and um, my relationship with Maury. Maybe the most important reason you kind of alluded to it, Lance, uh, you know, you're familiar with the Son of Sam, but when you watched the documentary, um, you saw a lot of things that, that you probably didn't realize. I realized my circle of friends and actually even some of my family members didn't know the story. I would say it was probably 2014, just in conversation, I mentioned 
that, you know, you know, being shot by a woman. And my sister said, what are you talking about? Barkowitz shot you. I looked at her, I'm like, really? You don't, you don't know that story? And, you know, so now this is 11, 12 years after Barkowitz's interview. And that's when I realized that my sister, who I'm actually very close with, if she doesn't know the story, there's a million, million other people out there that, that have no idea. They're still talking about Talking Dogs and Spike Lee's movie and and uh, and Maury Terry, the crackpot, uh, which is, is so far from the truth, it's laughable. He was certainly no crackpot. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He was a serious uh, journalist and investigator and committed, damn committed to what he was going after. Um, and you had said that you and him instantly became friends during that first meeting. What was it about him that you saw? And what do you think it was about you that he saw that made that connection happen so quickly? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I have to tell you, probably the second thing I said to Maury after I said, um, uh, hello, <laughs> was, uh, you should have stopped. I loved your book, but you should have stopped 200 pages earlier. <laughs> When he did, he did not like that. So, um, but I, I maybe he just liked my honesty. I don't know. Um, but uh, I'm, you know, we we were supposed to have dinner um, before the uh, car picked us up, and we decided to stay at the bar. So I guess that's another. Uh, you know, we both had that in common. <laughs> hanging out of the bar. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a lot of good bonding that happens there, especially when they're you know two people with such. Um, you don't find the two of you together in that same environment at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it's, it, it, yeah, I, you, you, it's, it's like either it's going to work or it's not going to work. And it, and it worked with the two of you. I think he was very, um, very happy that, um, that I believed in this theory and, and I do believe in it. And it's not for any other reason than the facts that he laid out to me. You know, I don't know how big the, this conspiracy is, uh, you know, is it nationwide? I really don't know. But I do know that David Berkowitz didn't act alone. Yeah, there is some pretty compelling evidence that is uh, laid out in the Netflix documentary Sons of Sam. And uh, I was particularly drawn towards the um, connection with, obviously, the uh, the actual Sons of Sam there, Michael and John Carr. And uh, that connection in Minot, North Dakota, where there was actually, uh, I think it was John Carr was actually confirmed to have been involved in some kind of satanic cult out there. And obviously he had known Berkowitz. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I, what I, what I tell people is, uh, it's almost too complicated and convoluted to even make up, you know, it's like, it, it, there's the facts that, you know, uh, every you know, it's a big country we live in, and yet all these all these strange coincidences happened in you know in this you know in Yonkers, and you know maybe I don't know fifteen square miles, um, and then you got this little pocket in uh, Minot, North Dakota, um, and lo and behold, there's a guy from Yonkers that lives there, and and you saw on the on the documentary, you know the police uh, were very aware of the. Um, satanic rituals going on um that's not in question at all we we have a, a co-worker uh jen who watched the documentary and, and she's very skeptical about the the satanic cult involvement and mostly because she doesn't see how they could organize like that i have a question for you which is are are you a religious person do you believe in god oh i certainly believe in god um <laughs> The priest would probably not agree that, that I'm uh, that religious, but I'm certainly spiritual. Um, right. I do believe in, I do believe in God. Um, I do believe in um, good and evil. I do believe in Satan. To be honest with you, though, that uh, has very little to do with my stand. Oh yeah. On, oh yeah. No, no. On this topic. Oh, absolutely. I'm getting more towards you believe in God. You mentioned your priest. Catholicism is an organized religion. How many organized religions are there? Why is it so hard for people to wrap their head around people organizing around Satanism and and being able to execute these crimes across the country when people are able to 
organize around Catholicism all across the country and the world. Or not even all the way across the country, but right there in that section in New York, you could sure. see the graffiti, the, the paintings, the dead dogs that were there that had signs of of stuff. So there, that was there. And I think one thing I've heard, I, I don't know what the rest of the audience has heard, but if there was one critique of the documentary, it was... Oh, satanic panic. No, I'm out. I'm not going to. People hear that and they're just like, oh, can't be anything to it. I'm not even going to go any further. Um, and that's just one piece of it. And I think the documentary, in my opinion, it, it just scratches the surface. It's, I think it mainly focuses on, on Maury's story and barely scratches the surface of some of the things that were going on, unreleased composite sketches. Uh, of different people, eyewitness accounts of skinny people with blonde hair driving away in yellow Volkswagens. Carl knows all this stuff. He can tell you about that stuff. Those are the things they really didn't get into a lot of detail in that um, in that documentary. Yeah, there's 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 a lot of evidence that um, I, I'm 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 not going to critique the uh, documentary because uh, I could tell you um, that. Uh, Josh wanted uh, an eight hour um, show and the best he could get was four. And he told me right up front two years ago that uh, four hours isn't enough. And, and I agree, but um, I certainly um, am happy that we got four hours on the air. Um, and, and he really, you know, it, again, it really, as you pointed out earlier, it's really, it's more about Maury than the son of, son of Sam. Um, but again, you can't talk about Maury without talking about the son of Sam. And it, I think I think uh, it was more geared toward younger people who uh, didn't live through uh, the 70s. I guess with the ad, with the advent of high school forensics, um, there's a whole new generation um, that know about the son of Sam because of that. But there's there's a big group of like, I'm going to say 30 to 50 year olds that really don't know about Son of Sam because they were too young when it happened. And, you know, unless they were a true crime fan, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't on the front page um, of, of the news, uh, except for, you know, for the you know, late seventies. The other, the other thing I wanted to touch on with it, you mentioned uh, the satanic panic. Um, Satanism, Satanism is real. It's real today. It was real then, and it was real two hundred years ago. It's been, you know, just like the word conspiracy. It's kind of been co-opted into something else. Um, you know, conspiracy is not a bad word, but yet today it has a very negative connotation. Um, it, for those who don't know, conspiracy just means more than two people involved. That's all it means. But when you hear conspiracy, I think we all kind of go towards the negative side. Um, and <clears throat> satanic panic to me is kind of like that. They, um, whoever, whoever they are, and I, I'm, I don't even know, I, I'm not, I'm not being evasive again. I just don't know, but, um, it was just kind of like, God, that's, that's all garbage. It's, you know, we just, it's all made up, but it's, it's not made up. And, and there's plenty of cases, um, even back in the 70s uh, and, and 80s when they were calling it the satanic panic that real things were happening people were getting killed um and there's cases all over the country you know i think that was just like a, a you know like almost like disinformation to kind of throw throw it off yeah we have charles manson you know and 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 we are pretty aware of what he did uh not actually having uh killed some of those victims and sort of i guess I don't know, sort of manipulating people into doing it or, or something like that. And, uh, and it's kind of complicated. Um, but you look at Berkowitz, especially when he's arrested, um, early in, you know, in that footage and he really looks like, uh, he's going through some tough times, uh, mentally doesn't look like he's all there completely different from the end of the documentary where he actually speaking pretty, uh, He's pretty coherent and pretty articulate. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's not it's not that hard to believe. I mean, we there is some track record of people sort of convincing others to 
do, you know, commit murder in the name of Satan um, right around that time period. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit more about the potential Charles Manson connection? I'll be quite honest with you. I'm, I see I see the dots and I see how they were connected. I'm not a firm believer. It was this this son of Sam cult wasn't part of a nationwide uh, conspiracy. Um, it's certainly possible. There's there's some evidence there. Um, but, uh, you know, bad people hang out with bad people. And, um, you know, California and New York, it's uh, there's a, you know, a lot of traffic back and forth. Good, good and bad people, you know, and it's, you know, it's the two hubs of, of this country, you know, New York City and, uh, and L.A. Um, so it, is it possible? It's, it's certainly possible. I just felt that um, the, the facts that Maury put together in, in the first, you know, 450 pages of The Ultimate Evil, um, everything made sense, uh, everything connected. Um, the names, uh, you know, the names, the stories, it, it all, it all matched. And then kind of when it, you know, when it went out to the Manson, you know, there's obviously connections, you know, the, the process church, um, the process church was in New York. Um, they also had, um, um, an office, if you will, um, on, uh, I believe it was like two or three doors down from where Manson lived when he lived in San Francisco. So there's a good chance he knew him. Um, and, and, you know, f- we, we do know that the process uh, is kind of like an offshoot of Scientology. Uh, the people that founded the process <clears throat> were in Scientology and they decided to come up with their own, their own thing. And we know that Manson was in sci- certainly studied Scientology. I don't know if he was officially in, in the group. So all these things, you know, I mean, I could see, I could, you know, I, I would need more information for you to convince me, you know, solidly that this was involved. But it's certainly, um, it's certainly worth investigating. Or, you know, I'm, I'm not even sure if you could investigate that today, uh, with so much time has passed. But uh, I just don't, I just don't think, I just think the facts that Maury put together, and later on, what I, me and other people helped Maury. Um, you know, up, update the case, if you will, the Son of Sam case. Um, to me, that's enough. Um, you know, I don't think you need to go. And it, again, it might be true, but uh, I, I would like to solve the uh, Son of Sam case. And uh, if, if we can ever get that done, um, I think branching out and connecting this possibly nationwide, um, you know, cult, it, it, you know, it's a possibility. But I think. I think you have to start at ground zero. Yeah, I think I you hit the nail right on the head because I think there's a big, uh, you get lost in the minutia of traveling cross country when you can focus right there where the crimes happen in New York and the things that make it possible that there was more than one shooter. You know, some, uh, and, and again, if Carl wants to talk about, you know, some of those things like the Illa Volkswagen, the parking ticket, he's getting while someone's doing the shooting a couple minutes later in the opposite direction. Those are the things that sort of get glossed over because everyone gets, gets into the satanic and Manson angles and stuff like that. Well, yeah, but I think that's important to show precedent. And I complicit uh, here in the, in the chat mentions that too. And you start talking about Scientology and uh, sowing chaos and you got me, I'm in. So that, that's when I think I started believing in the documentary. So I, I think you really do need that precedent um, because, yeah, because I'll, I'll be honest, the eyewitness part doesn't get me, uh, you know, the, the part where, uh, um, you know, uh, they couldn't, he couldn't have been there. That, that part, I'm like, well, I don't know. It was, someone could be off by a couple of minutes. I don't know. I wasn't there. That, that's fair enough. Like I said, um, until this case is solved, any any uh, any opinion and uh, any assumption. Um, although I, I hate when people assume things on, on this case because I, I take it personal. Um, everything is fair game, and um, and I, I understand that. Um, but to go back to the original, the original question of like. Um, uh, you know, how can they be, you know, how can this be, uh, this satanic nationwide cult be 
um, you know, so organized. Um, that, to me, to me, that's uh, to me. Maury fell into in, into the uh, the trap of uh, of the story going all, all, all different directions and losing focus on what what he knows about. You know what? You know. I mean, he lived in Yonkers. He had, you know, he had a lot of cop friends. He had, you know, um, he he had a lot of contacts. Um, and I just, you know, so that's my opinion. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, you know I, I, obviously I'm wrong because because you, um, that's when you got that's when you got hooked, <laughs> right? <laughs> when you know when that came in. So so maybe my um, my thinking is uh, a little skewed. But uh, that's what makes the world go round. So that's good. Yeah, and and you know, um, I, Tim, you had said uh, something. I just wrote it down that you had used the word complicated, um, and I don't even know where where you use that, like why you use that word. But it made me think about how it's probably not that complicated to organize a group of people who are looking for something to believe in in all different uh, fact, like different areas of the country, and have that spread because. While there wasn't any internet back then, there was still, there was still a general. It's going to sound kind of hippie, and I apologize, but there was still a general vibe back then. There was still a general feeling, and and you'd see something on the news, and and you'd see about uh, some community, some counterculture community, and you'd feel that vibe, whether you were in uh, North Dakota or. Uh, upstate California or upstate New York, you, you'd see that and you'd feel the vibe. And even though you weren't directly connected with these people, if you were looking for something in that uh, almost post-Vietnam War era, uh, you you wanted that. Like you wanted something to, to believe in and you, you saw it and it was probably not as complicated as we think to just sign on to it. And and there you have your your seeds. Like there you have the sowing of the seeds that could really grow into something else. Like like we just said, Scientology came from right. something. And well, that well, that's what what my my point about him, Scientology and Manson is that that's done by people who know what they're doing. They know right. what kind of personality types they're looking for, and they know how to turn them into Manchurian candidates, if you will. Don't ever talk about Tom Cruise that way. <laughs> 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 That's okay by me. <laughs> yeah, to, uh, to your point, you've got a bunch of people that are looking to fit into something and be part of something, and maybe they're loners, maybe they're uh, lonely, and they're looking to belong. So, you know, someone comes along and says, hey, you can be part of our group. You know, that's how some, some of these people get reeled into to bad groups, whether it's satanic or whatever, you know. A gang, whatever. Next thing you know, you're storming the Capitol with Q signs. Because what the hell is that about, right? Like, I mean, it's so it it starts. That's a, that's as, a good point. How did how did they organize? <laughs> yeah, it starts off as almost a joke, and then it's like, oh, okay, I guess we're doing this for real now. Well, there's a cult playbook that you can yep. follow. <laughs> I mean, and uh, you know, I think some there have been some examples that you could look to. I mean, w- one thing you know is. The, the leader is never wrong. How does that sound familiar to anyone? Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, there's there's ways you can do, you can apparently do that with, with impressionable people. And I, th- I think one thing that's underestimated that I've learned uh, recently from from watching uh, Generation Hustle on uh, on HBO Max is that when when you're not expecting uh, people with bad intentions, um, they can sneak up on you. It uh, it just I, I don't think. I, I maybe it's easy to just to fool people if you've got bad intentions. Absolutely. I mean you're 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 like a mosquito, right? You're like a mosquito sucking blood from from people. Like that's what you're looking for. Without going too far down that rabbit hole, I'm really <laughs> curious about your relationship with Maury. And one part of the documentary that stood out to me was when you and him almost came came to odds about what he knew and what you knew. And you had said what are you talking about when he said to you, like, what have you done? And you said, what do you mean? I got shot in the head. What did you do? Like, what what does it take for that relationship to get to that point? And, and how concerned were you for him? Concerned in, in what way? What, what do you mean? 
Like, were you concerned that he was that for for his health? Like, you're you've gone oh, too far. No, 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 no. It, um. Uh, okay, so I guess first you have to. I have to describe Maury's um, uh, personality. Maury was extremely smart. Um, he knew a lot about a lot of different things. Um, you know, from sports to music to writing to just general knowledge. He, he was an extremely intelligent guy. And, and he was always fun to talk to because it was never a dull moment. Uh, you know, it was always something to talk about. And he always, he always enlightened me with something, but he was also very demanding. You know, he'd get pissed off like if if he would call me and later later on when when he had email, he would email me and I didn't get back to him. He would like he'd get pissed off. It's like, you know, where have you been? You know, I've been trying to get in touch with you. And it's like because I have a life and I have to, you know, I have to go to work. I have to take care of my daughter. You know, and there's other things going on besides besides this investigation that at this point is 35 years old. It's not something that. You know, we got to do this today because it's going to disappear. Um, but that was Maury. Um, the other, the other thing with Maury was this was his case, and you know what? In a lot of respects, he's right. I mean, he's the he's the one that spent ten years um, studying and researching and asking questions, and and then put together a six hundred page book. And my book's one hundred eighty two pages, and. and <laughs> and it took me a long time. So I, I really, if I didn't appreciate it before, I definitely appreciate uh, the work that he put into it. But it didn't stop there. That was 1987. He continued on. Um, but at some point, especially when he enlisted other people to help, when they came up with, when they put two and two together and got four, and no, it's wrong. You're wrong. It's not the old. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Didn't you say this is true? And didn't you say this is true? Well, this must be true too. Well, no, you're wrong. You're going down the wrong path. And uh, what I found out after his death, um, that uh, I wasn't always wrong. Um, sometimes um, sometimes he, I did have the right answer and he told me it was the wrong answer. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, I believe me, I was, as, as heartbroken as I was when he passed away, because uh, like I said, he, he was a friend, a mentor, a champion. I, there, there was there was you know quite a few times uh, that I was angry, you know that I that you know he wasn't up front with me. But that's um, that's Maury, and you know going back to the documentary, his uh, his ex wife, I thought she uh, explained it perfectly. Um, and else, she was married to the guy. And um, she said it much better than I just did. He, you know, he was, he, he was, he was hard to handle. <laughs> you know, and, and and but very driven. You know, and I guess I don't know. Maybe if you're that driven, you have blinders on, and um, you don't see left and right. You just see straight ahead. Uh, it's it's interesting because you're you're both coming at it from different angles too. You're looking to find out the truth about why you got shot. And he's focusing on the whole case overall. You're sort of going down different things. Did you find that Maury shifted a lot? That changed when something new came along. He would change course, or, or... yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, um, you know, what I don't, I what I didn't really get into in my book, and it certainly wasn't brought up in the uh, docu documentary. But um, uh, Maury and I worked on besides the son of Sam. I did some, you know, some work for him because. Uh, once I started doing internet searches for him, um, I, I realized that number one, I'm pretty good at it and I liked it. Um, so, you know, when 9-11 came along, um, we kind of like put the brakes on Son of Sam and spent, I don't know, 18 months, you know, delving into that. And then uh, and halfway through that, you know, the anthrax uh, scare. So we did some, you know, some work on that. Um, as far as I know, nothing ever came of it, but, um, I, you know, uh, but as far as the Son of Sam investigation, um, he was always pretty focused um, and he could keep, uh, you know, a few coals in the fire at the same time, you know, 
you know, looking at Yonkers or look, you know, and, and looking at North Dakota at the same time. And how do you uh, think that his treatment by the media? How do you think that affected him? Because at first he was uh, welcomed as as a uh, as a hero in in that particular field, and when I first saw the cover of his book with the dog and the the fangs all of a sudden it became a cartoon. And then I realized, oh my God, the media is using him. Uh, was that apparent to you when, when it was happening? Or do you think it was apparent to him? Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe maybe no one realized that they were using him. I, I, I think the best way to explain that, I, I just want to mention about the book, and, and I totally agree. And I also mentioned that to Maury. I said, why in God's name did you put a, a dog's face on the, uh, on the cover? It, that's not what the story's about, and, and, you know. I, I and I, I thought that was, in retrospect, that might have been the beginning of um, of his troubles with um, the general public, the press, and the police. But um, and, you know, enough about that. I'm not sure who designed that book cover. It was he being used. Um, you have to realize, Maury Maury was an outsider. He wasn't a cop. He was an investigator. He was a technical writer. Um, and so when he, you know, got this book together, he wants to get a story out. So, uh, I guess maybe, you know, no pun intended, but you, you make a deal with the devil and next thing you know, you're doing shows with, um, yeah, people that, uh, you may or may not really like, uh, who, you know, and they might be using you, um, you know, uh, just because hey. This is a hot topic. You mentioned Son of Sam. We're going to get, you know, 10 million viewers. I really don't care what that guy says. Let's just get him on. Um, I think that, you yeah, know, was true. I mean, he definitely, definitely had a hard time with the police. Um, and that, and I know that really pissed him off because that was right in his face. You know, the whole TV thing was kind of, you know, I'm really saying this in retrospect. Uh, I, I didn't really see it at the time or even after I met him, um, I didn't think he was being used. But uh, in retrospect, I think he might have been because the people the people that pursued his story and helped him pursue his story, um, once he walked away from a particular TV show, they never mentioned it again. So that tells me they really weren't into it. They were just into the son of Sam because it's going to get ratings. So. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair point that, you know, the, pre the press used them. Uh, the cops just just destroyed them. You know, they, uh, you know, there was, a, you know, Detective Joe Coffey. I know he's well decorated. Uh, um, he certainly knew his way around the, the world of the mafia. God, he was a thorn in the side <laughs> to Maury and, and to be honest to, with me, too, um, because he was just, Talk about Maury having blinders on, looking straight ahead. Joe Coffey would not would not look at anything. He wouldn't even admit um, he, he wouldn't admit one iota of Maury's um, uh, research uh, could be true. You know, it was all total garbage, and uh, and the guy's a, a nut. And uh, he he carried that on for uh, fifteen years. Joe Coffey did. Well, I guess, Lance, back to that word complicated, what I, what I meant by that is that that is a complicated thing. How do you talk someone into doing something? That's a weird mental trick. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, maybe? I, I guess so. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. You know, it, it, and this is not a theory. This is yeah. true. But I don't, I, I, it, it, the theory that I'm going to say right now, you know, what I'm saying right now is a theory, uh, but uh, we do know that that Berkowitz, um, you know, pretty much got out of the army. You know, I mean, just look at him. You pretty much have the picture of what this guy was about. You know, I don't think he hated women. I, I, I just don't think he had a knack for talking to women or, you know, going on a date with a woman. Uh, he, he seemed to uh, be lacking that. So now he meets this group and... Um, you know, well, it's crazy. They're doing, you know, uh, you know, rituals and chanting in the woods. But there's women there. There's drugs there. There's alcohol there. Next thing you know, he's being invited to parties, um, and this, you know, it's, he's being invited to parties in mansions on Long Island and in Westchester. 
So you can only imagine what, what was offered at, at these parties. And here's this schlub from uh, Co-op City, and all of a sudden he's in somebody's mansion. And uh, you know, there was two 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 people in particular. Uh, their 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 private phone numbers were in Berkowitz's uh, address book. Two of these mansions that I'm talking about. So uh, I mean, it's not how how would how would this this schlub or whatever word you want to use, uh, how would this guy get get the private phone number of, of somebody that owned the 28 room mansion in Long Island or Westchester? Were these, uh, were these uh, some of the people that were in the documentary? Jeez, not, you stumped me. Uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think, well, actually, I, you know, Roy, Roy Raiden is one of them. Right, right. Uh, yeah. I, I believe Roy Raiden was uh, mentioned, uh, um, you know, and uh, and that that's a whole nother story um, where there's eyewitness. I know you don't like eyewitnesses, but there's uh, there's delivery men, and I'm not talking about the local pizza, you know, local pizza guy. I'm talking about contractors and carpenters um, who who had done work in Raiden's uh, mansion, and the stories that came out of there, you know, uh, you know, 65, 70 year old men. Uh, walking on all fours with a dog leash around their neck and a dominatrix with the leash. Um, this is documented. It's not part of Son of Sam. It's not part of the documentary. But uh, you can you can look at police reports out in um, the Hampton, Hamptons in, in Long Island, and uh, this will be verified. How do you feel? Berkowitz treated Maury when Ma- Maury interviewed him, especially towards the end, like the later interviews. Do you think that he was placating to him a bit? It certainly looked that way, didn't it? It certainly, yeah, looked a bit like that. I, I you know, I kind of cringed, uh, uh, you know, rewatching it, uh, rewatching those interviews um, because uh, there is a big difference between the interviews done in '93 and the ones done in '98. And um, I know one of the criticisms that people have posted on social media and private messages to me is, uh, you know, Maury was uh, leading Berkowitz, and um, I, I can't, I can't say they're wrong. You know, I mean, I'm not sure why he did it that way because he didn't do that in '90 in the '93. I don't think. In my opinion, I don't think he led Berkowitz at all in '93 in those um, interviews. But the '98 interviews, uh, yeah, <clears throat> yes. Um, just a little side story uh, with the '98 interviews. Um, that was a long time coming. Amori had no no idea he was going to have to wait five years to get more interviews. Uh, there was a period in there, I believe a two year period, when, when Berkowitz didn't even respond to him. So Maury had to kind of like rebuild them. Um, and it wasn't, it actually wasn't Maury's fault or anything. It was just other other influences of Berkowitz's life. And he just stopped talking to Maury. So um, I think Maury kind of saw this as like, this is probably never going to happen again. I'm going to get the information on tape. And uh, to that end, I think uh, he might have been a little, again, it, it's really not a criticism. I, that's just my opinion. Yeah, one thing I always uh, meant to ask you, Carl, and I haven't asked you this yet, but just curious to, to play devil's advocate. When someone comes up to you and says, well, you know, David Berkowitz was just lying and just saying whatever more he wanted to hear. Uh, when someone says that and sort of tries to dismiss everything just based on the fact he's lying, what do you say? What do you counter that with? Well, what I've said for the last 25 years is I'll sit and talk with you for two hours, but read The Ultimate Evil first. Now, I added my book to that list and then come back and talk to me because um, you don't have to believe, you know, uh, there's, there's, as, as I've said during, you know, during the show, um, there's parts of the story that I don't buy. Um, and some parts of the story that, yeah, I can see where there's a connection, but I'm not totally convinced. But I am totally convinced uh, on a lot of things. Most of that is in the f- uh, first half of uh, The Ultimate Evil. So, you know, again, you know, we have, you know, mentioned it earlier, but, you know, you have this, the police sketches. You have eyewitnesses, 
uh, people that were shot, although they they were eyewitnesses too. But there was there was neighbors who saw, you know, a guy running down the street with a, a gun in his left hand. Uh, Berkowitz is right-handed. I, I happen to be left-handed. I would never. I would. I wouldn't put my pens. My wouldn't take a pen after I started writing and I put it in my right hand to walk away. It just, that doesn't make sense. And I think the same thing is true with a gun, especially after you just shot somebody and you're running away, you would put it in your non-dominant hand. That doesn't make any sense. But anyway, that, I mean, that's just one of many, many circumstantial pieces of evidence. The yellow Volkswagen you mentioned earlier, um, the cops were all over that. If you go back to uh, reading newspaper articles um, back in 77, they were, they, it was all point bolt and on yellow Volkswagens. They did everything they could. And when they arrested Berkowitz, you never heard Volkswagen again. Never again did, they, did anyone mention the Volkswagen because Berkowitz owned the Galaxy. Yeah, and there's a, and everybody, we can argue like debate, accuracy of sketches. There's a lot of sketches out there. You could just Google sort of Sam sketches and just see all these different ones. And to me, a lot, a lot of them, depending on the lighting and the witness's memory, they could all be Berkowitz, but there's certain ones that, especially the ones that weren't released, you know, you've got a, a skinny blonde uh, guy um, that just in no way you can't, in my opinion, you just can't confuse a skinny blonde guy with David Berkowitz. And I think that witness Tommy Zeno, am I right, Carl? He got a really good look at him. He's, he's a really compelling eyewitness. And, and if, to me, if, if there's something to it, and and there is someone else involved, then then we don't know all the facts about this case. Then, um, and that's what I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep. And like I said, I you know, uh, with Maury's passing, um, I don't know, there might be someone out there that knows more than me. But um, as far as I know, I'm quote unquote the expert, and I'll be the first to tell you. I know a lot of things, but, but I don't have, I, I'm not even close to all the answers. The young woman who was in the car with you when you were shot, did she see the person who, who did it? Not that, and the I'm, not that I'm aware of. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, again, you know, I leave it up to the police. And in this particular case, I'm not sure I mentioned this, but uh, um, her dad was uh, Detective Red Keenan. He, he was an NYPD cop, and uh, he was assigned to my case, which uh, who knew, but I found out many years later that's, that's kind of strange. Um, I have no idea what that means. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm just telling you uh, what, what I found out. Um, but it was his daughter, you know, his he wasn't happy with me, as you can imagine, but uh, his daughter was shot at. And, uh, and I know, I know that he, he did everything he could to, to quote unquote, solve the case. But again, this is before it was Son of Sam. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I know that he went back to the bar, um, him and his partner, uh, like once a week for six, seven, eight months, every, you know, asking people, did you know Carl Tadaro? Like, did you see any, any strange people in the bar that night? You know, did Carl have any enemies? And it always came back negative. That doesn't mean that it's true. But apparently, he was happy with that part of the investigation. You know, I still struggle with that. Of like, you know, why was you know was I selected? You know, it's, uh, did they follow me? They did. I got to the bar at twelve o'clock. We didn't leave till like quarter to two. And Rosemary was already at the bar. So if somebody was waiting for her or for me, they were sitting in a car for close to two hours. Hope you know, and you know, back then, you know, bar state. Well, they still do. Still, you know, they close at four, and that bar. I, I can't tell you how many times I walked home at seven in the morning. So <laughs> there was no guarantee that I was going to leave. That you know, so. But it, you know what? If if someone want, you know, if someone's looking for me, I guess I guess you would wait for four hours. I. This is just a theory that people have thrown out there. I I, I have no idea. If someone, if anyone out there has the answer, please let me know. Um, you know, because that's been a big mystery to me, not only who shot me, but why and how did you find me? Like, you know, was I, I don't think I was targeted, but on the other hand, 
you went down, you know, you found found a couple making out at two o'clock on a, you know, two o'clock in the morning in a, in a neighborhood that is it's not a lover's lane. It's a residential street. Um, maybe somebody might be walking their dog, um, but no foot traffic at all. There's a good video too that Carl just made. He was a guest on, and and you'll have to plug whoever that is. Uh, oh, it's Manny Manny Grossman. He, he actually Carl walks with him. The, the basically the entire route isn't it from the bar to the spot we were shot so you can really see where it happened yes thanks for bringing that up that's actually yeah yeah just just google uh, manny grossman on youtube and uh he's 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 actually got a whole series of son of sam uh he calls them walk and talks uh that they're all they're all pretty interesting you know one takes you through onto meyer park another one takes you to berkowitz's apartment the car's house and uh other other episodes uh uh you know to give you a visual of uh, um the, the areas what a, what a really uh fascinating thing to wrap your head around why was somebody there at that time in the morning no one was there was no guarantee that two 20 somethings would would leave a bar and decide that that's where they're going to park to make out but that's where that person was and that's where the two of you were so i could i could see where her father you said something interesting before where you said he obviously wasn't very happy with me. And I was kind of confused by that for a second. I was wondering, well, well, well what did you do? Well, uh, I, okay. So I think the way I describe myself in the book is, um, you know, six foot, uh, six foot uh, self-proclaimed hippie with, you know, construction boots, dungarees, flannel shirt, you know, hair, hand earring, pot smoker, you know, staying out late. And, I'm, you know, I'm with his daughter and she gets shot at. So, you know, he, he the first and again, this is before Son of Sam, uh, he, they were going under the assumption it was a drug deal. You know, I, I told him, I said, well, I, I smoke pot, but I, I don't deal drugs. I never have. And I, I'm, I'm assuming I never will. You know, I'm 65 now. I found out uh, many, many years later, and I'm going to say like, I don't know, 2010, 11, supposedly there was a party um two blocks away we assume or it, it's a possible a possibility that that uh people people from you know in the cult were attending this party two blocks away which would put them in the proximity that part of the story is in my book i, I can't reveal everything i'd like people to buy my book <laughs> Thank you.